Good evening, everybody. Shus of the Rosh Hashiva. Uh, David Mandel asked me to introduce myself. It's a new task. I never did that before. Uh, but uh, my name is Norman Blumenthal. I'm the Zachter Chair for Trauma, Bereavement, and Crisis Intervention for OHL Children's Homes and Family Services. And it's a humbling experience to be here tonight and to see the turnout as well. I want to thank Ritzvi for everything he does, David Mandel. And a special thank you to the Rosh Hashiva. Um, gives me an opportunity to highlight someone who probably is one of the people who have influenced me, influenced me more to be who I am today, other than my immediate family, which is the Rosh Hashiva's illustrious cousin, Rav Aaron Kreiser, Zechot Tzadik Levracha, who really taught me how to think. Um, on two occasions, I had to go to Mexico, Mexico City, because of a crisis that occurred there. Uh, I don't know how many of you have been to Mexico City, but they have an interesting style of driving. And I was being taken around by one particular person on one day, and he's weaving in and out of traffic, totally no, no, nowhere near the speed limit, ignoring traffic signals and the like, and I started wondering whether I was really going to make it home from this trip. Uh, sensing my trepidation, he, very, he turned to me and very delicately said, here in Mexico, we consider a red light a suggestion. <laughs> there are speeches that I give sometimes that are suggestions. Perhaps how to be better parents, maybe shalom bias, maybe how to help children process news. Those are suggestions. Tonight, it's an imperative. Tonight, it's a red light. And again, I commend all those who organize this. Actually, interestingly, and a lot of what I'm going to say is a repeat of what already was said, the word addiction comes from the Latin word for being enslaved. And I understand that in Hebrew. The word for addiction is machur, sold. And it's very much, that's the point. And sometimes when I'm dealing with clients, and you're going to hear later from my colleague Akiva Perlman, who's going to talk about the actual treatment, I'm going to be focusing on the risk factors. But when I'm dealing with a client and they're trying to struggle and figure out, are they addicted or do they, are they just indulging? The answer I'll, sometimes I ask them is, are you controlling it or is it controlling you? And that's really the key difference. Now, when we talk about risk factors, risk factors is a very tricky area. And it's because of something that we call in psychology false positives. So let me give you what might be a sort of silly example. Suppose you notice that all peach trees have a flower and a fruit hanging down underneath. So you'll naturally conclude then that every tree that has a flower must be a peach tree. It doesn't work that way because there are many trees that have flowers that produce other fruits or don't produce any fruit at all. And the same thing is true with risk factors. We can study those who are addicted and say, what do they have in common? What, uh, what's in common in their background. And let's say we identify certain risk factors. However, there are many people who have those very same risk factors and never become addicts. The true way to study it, which is very hard, is to just take a sampling of the population, follow them for years, and then try to identify who has become addicted and who has not. It's a very hard thing to do. There's also a very unique math to risk factors. Let's say I take five risk factors for addiction. And we'll talk about what some of those are in a minute. And I assign a number to each one. I say each one is a value of two. As we often say in the field, you know, five out of four psychologists don't know math, so we'll see how I do with this. But each one is assigned a two. And if you have two risk factors, math would say you have a four. But it doesn't work that way. In risk factors, two plus two equals six. And 2 plus 2 plus 2 equals 12. And the combination of several risk factors is what's often so toxic. So what are the risk factors? Well, it's been studied, and guess what? It's going to sound like a smorgasbord of just about everything that can go wrong psychologically with a person. High numbers of children with, or adults for that matter, with dysregulatory disorders, sometimes referred to as ADD. And those of you who don't know what ADD is, it's what's afflicting most of you now while I'm speaking. An inability to focus, impulsivity. It's also associated with depression, with anxiety. 
with, ab with abuse, being victims of abuse. There's a strong inherited component. Research shows 40 to 60 percent of addiction is probably inherited, whether it's actually an, a tendency to be getting addicted or whether it's these factors that come together. But it's the garden variety of all the kind of afflictions that affect us. And to echo what was said earlier, it really speaks to our having to come to terms with our humanity, to come to terms with the fact that even though we are Shomrei Torah mitzvos, we are also human beings. And we are vulnerable to all the ailments that occur to everybody else. And if we ignore it, if we stick our head in the sand, if we figure it's just childish behaviors that could, that's going to go away, it can lead to devastating results. You know, the, there's a, and by the way, just to show you also, the research shows that only 18% of addicts meet the criteria of what we would call, let's say, a psychopath, a criminal person, which is higher than the general population, but it means that over 80% are not criminal, immoral types of people. But it also is said, it addresses the problem, and we really, again, it has, can't be emphasized enough. We are blessed today with a cater of mental health professionals in the Orthodox community. I believe Relief has a database of like 1,500 Shomrei Torah Mitzvahs who are trained mental health professionals in the New York metropolitan area. We have an organization like Amudim, like OHEL, OHEL providing clinics with low cost treatment. We have to, if you have to err, err in the direction of rushing too fast to get the help, because the rule of thumb is the earlier you move in, the earlier you remedy any of these kinds of problems, even environmental problems, whether it's marital discord, financial stressors, whatever it might be, the sooner you move in and correct it, the less devastating it may be. And many of you may have heard of this new Netflix film that there's a great deal of coverage about, The 13 Reasons Why, if those of you who hadn't. It's based on a book that was written in 2007, which a girl who died of a suicide and by the way, we're getting away from the term committed suicide, for those of you who may want to know, because it harks back to a time when people talk about committing a crime, that it was considered criminal. But if a girl who died of a suicide and sent out 13 tapes, the people she held responsible, has now been made a film, and without even going into whether there should be a film that young people are watching about suicide, whether or not, and I think the research shows pretty convincingly that there is a contagion to suicide, known as the Werther effect, but there's another piece about that film that is very damaging. There's no reference in this entire film of a competent and caring mental health professional or in any responsible way seeking out help from mental health professionals. The few that are featured, I haven't seen them, but I've heard about it, the few that are featured are incompetent and part of the problem instead of the solution. That's not reality. There's some wonderful, caring, talented mental health professionals, and we have to learn how to take advantage of their services. And we have to know our children. It's almost hackneyed by now. I'm almost embarrassed to repeat what's probably been repeated in just about every parenting class for the last 10, 15 years. But the research shows convincingly that families that eat dinner together on a regular nightly basis have almost a zero occurrence of substance abuse and addictions. And we'd like to think well, maybe that's because there's, but there's a family cohesiveness, and there is. That's an important point. In fact, some of you may be familiar with some of the research which they call the Rat Park, in which research that shows, I mean, the early studies of addiction put a rat in a cage alone with two bottles, one or, or two feeding tubes, I guess, one with heroin and one with water, and the rat just became addicted to heroin. But someone later did a study in which he put the rat in a beautiful cage with a lot of friends, you know, where they had a kahila. There was a young Israel of rats, and there was an Agud of rats, you know, there was everything. A Pirche, they had the whole business. And most of the rats did not choose the heroin. So community belonging and feeling part of the community is an antidote to addiction. And by the way, an interesting aside, I mean, I think I've, my riddle is wearing off because I'm, I'm jumping around, I apologize. But one of the groups that is considered at risk and again, at risk doesn't mean most, but some, are gifted children, intellectually precocious children, because that's a challenge too. And anybody who's apart from the society, whether they're apart because of their deficits or they're apart even because of a precocity, 
If you're not part of society, you're at risk. But the other part about having meals together is that you get to know your child or you get to know your spouse. You know, one of my favorite, uh, in the Shusha Rashivan, with the other people who are more deserving, my favorite Divrei Torah is the question about Birkos Yaakov. We call it, we have at the end of Parshat Vayichiv, the blessings of Yaakov. If you look at them, they really don't blessings. Yaakov says some very nice things to Yehuda, to Benjamin, to Yosef. Reuven, Shimon, and Levi, he beats them up. And the rest of them, it's an evaluation. You're like a snake, you're like a donkey. And in fact, even Ezra says they're not brachas. And yet we have retained this concept of Berchas Yaakov. So I once heard someone say something very beautiful. You know what the bracha is? The bracha is if you have a father who has 12 children and knows exactly what to say to each child, knows which one needs praise, which one needs punishment, which one needs validation, and knows how to validate that child, that's a bracha. So the bracha is embedded in having a parent like a Yaakov. But we have to know our child, children, and each child, I don't have to tell you, is a parsha bifnayatsmo. One more thing, so important to prevention, and I'll try to say this delicately, but it's important. We need in our community healthy outlets. Healthy outlets for all the stress and pressure. Today, there is no excuse, pardon me for saying it, but there is absolutely no excuse for yeshiva not to have a basketball court not to have a gym or a workout room. Our boys who have so much pressure on them, pressure not only to do well and to excel, but to exercise levels of restraint that are almost unthinkable in the world around them. And the girls as well, that there should be art, there should be music for everybody, that they're healthy outlets, so the outlets won't be drinking, etc. And then another point which was emphasized, and I'm going to say it a little differently, not as well, but I'm going to emphasize it, our enormous tolerance for drinking. And that's not to say that we can't drink. We are not ascetics. We believe in enjoying the gifts from Hashem that are in this world. But it's the emphasis that we place on it. I cannot tell you how many times I've heard this version of a story. I mean, I'm loath usually to share things I hear from sessions, but this one I've heard so many times in so many different ways I can share it. Of a child who indulged, who got involved in drugs and substances, etc. And I always ask, when did it start? And they'll tell me that they went out of shul during, for the kiddush club, or they went to a kiddush, and it wasn't just that the parents drank, but there was such an excitement. I got blue label, black label, a, a boutique liqueur, and you watch this as a child and say, I can't wait to be part of this. You know, we learn in Parshas Noach. Noah that says, Vaychal Noach, that Noah, Rashi says right there, when Noah got drunk and was, was, a, was violated, it says, Vaychal Noach, Rashi says, he made himself chulen because the first thing he should, he, he should have grown was not grapes. The first, first thing he should have nurtured in this new world was not wine. He should have grown something else, should have grown wheat, and then then a vineyard. We, we place it, we make it an emphasis, we make it exciting. Have a drink. I remember as a child, my father, Lava Shalom, used to tell me when you have a lachaim after the fish, that the fish has to swim. And I picture all these rivers made of bourbon. But it was, you have a lachaim, of course, but not, not such, an, such an emphasis and a focus. And similarly, if you go to an afraf and the chassan's friend gets up to speak, and his speech is slurred, and he can barely stand on the podium, it's not cute. It's not funny. And it shouldn't, I don't know if to get up there and give him 40 lashes, but it's not funny. Why? That boy, yeah. He'll get it out of his system and he'll become a Rosh Hashiva someday. But maybe sitting in the audience is some kid who's teetering on the brink. And maybe there's a kid in the audience who's struggling with depression and ADHD. Or maybe the parents are going through a high conflict divorce and he's thinking about it. And seeing everybody amused by that drinking will tip the scale for him. It's a communal response. Let me just mention two more points and then I'll hand the podium over to my colleague. It's an interesting thing about addiction. When someone is addicted or early in addiction and needs treatment, they have to be dealt with very aggressively. As you'll hear shortly, part and parcel 
of addiction is denial. Part and parcel is not being able, every, any kid, is, anybody, adult or child is addicted. No, I can control my, I can stop any time. That's the myth. And sometimes, and if you, you'll, you'll hear that a lot of tr uh, substance abuse treatments are very aggressive for that reason, because you have to break through the denial. That requires maybe a confrontational, it might even require a stern approach. But once they make that commitment to be in treatment, and once they overcome or in the early stages of recovery, they need abundant love and support and respect. I've had physicians, mathematicians in my office who are celebrating their one year of abstinence, and I tell them this is bigger than your degree. This is huge because it's very hard. You're combating, you're by now, you're combating a part of uh, your brain. You're fighting your, the very anatomy of your brain that's bringing you and crave, making you crave these substances. And at that point, we have to be loving and supportive and not in any way trivialize their accomplishments. Back in the 80s, Nancy Reagan, who was the first lady, had, was on a, a, her anti-drug campaign. She had a slogan called, just say no. Many of the people in the substance abuse uh, work, the substance abuse field, said that Nancy Reagan has a solution to the homeless problem. Just buy a home. There's no such thing as just say no. It's a remarkable accomplishment. And then last, but certainly not least, if your friend, a member of your family, if your friend himself or herself is struggling with addiction, or have a child who's struggling with addiction, Please don't judge. There but for the grace of God go all of us. Any one of us can fall prey. And we can't look down in a judgmental kind of way. Again, I forgive for being a little bit rabbinic, but you know, we have the Parsha Ben Sora Mora in the Torah of the miscreant child. And if those of you are familiar with the Gemara, the Gemara describes the parents of this kid. And you think, boy, these must be lousy parents to raise a child who has to be executed. And yet they're picture-perfect parents. They are, have no blemishes. There's absolutely nothing wrong with them. And talk about being coordinated. We always say parents have to be coordinated. Their voices are identical. They're the same height. You can't even tell them apart. And what's the Gemara teaching us? And Samson von Hirsch says, if, you have a, if something goes wrong with your child or something goes wrong yourself, self-examine, search, think. Maybe I did something wrong. But you know what? You can be a picture-perfect parent and still have a Ben Sora Amara. So let's work together. Let's work together as a community. Let's unite. Let's not be judgmental. And Mitzvah Hashem will triumph over this scourge. Thank you very much.